to 21, which is in essence the Matthew's telling of the first Palm Sunday. So this is Matthew's rendition, Matthew's version of what happened that day. So we're in Matthew 21 and reading verses 1 through 17. So Matthew 21, verses 1 through 17. And Matthew writes for us today, when they, Jesus and his followers, had come near Jerusalem and had reached Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, go into the village ahead of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, just say this, the Lord needs them. And he'll send them immediately. This took place to fulfill what had been spoken to the prophet, saying, Tell the daughter Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees, which is why we have our palms today, and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and that followed were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in turmoil, asking, who is this? The crowds were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. Then Jesus entered the temple and drove out all who were selling and buying in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you are making a den of robbers. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he cured them. But when the chief priests and scribes saw the amazing things that he did and heard the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they became angry. And they said to Jesus, do you hear what these are saying? Jesus says to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? You prepared praise for yourself. Jesus left them, went out of the city to Bethany, and he spent the night there. So may God add a blessing to the reading. I also just share before I share my thoughts with you today in a sermon is that if my mind is not very sharp today, there is a reason uh, for that. Yes, last night, or I guess early this morning would be more accurate, about two o'clock in the morning, I woke up uh, with a feeling that my, my sugar had dropped. I am a diabetic. I've been diabetic for almost 15 years now. In fact, uh, part of why I fell so madly in love with my wife is that she was dating me when I experienced my first round of rejection for my lung transplant, and they had to give me a mega dose of steroids. And they told me, once you get this dose, you will be a diabetic. And uh, sure enough, I, I was. But Michelle was just dating me, and it wasn't any assurance I would survive the rejection, but she stayed with me uh, throughout the whole time. So I, I knew I got a keeper, right? <laughs> and, and so uh, I got married, engaged that time, and married then for almost 15 years now in October. And, and Michelle continues to put up with me uh, trust me, it's not easy uh, living with me because of what happened last night. So at 2 in the morning, uh, I felt like my sugar had dropped. I woke up, and I was going to go check my sugar, and uh, I reached for my glasses, and I, I couldn't find them. They weren't on the nightstand. And it is so hard. I, I learned this. It is so hard to try to find your glasses when you're not wearing, <laughs> right? I might even thought to myself, well, let me just put on my glasses, then I can find my glasses, right? Which is ridiculous, I realized. So here I was searching 
on the floor, under the bed, all around. And eventually, I had to wake up the one who could see. Uh, so I woke up Michelle at 2 in the morning. I was like, baby, I, I can't find my glasses. And, and my sugar's low. And so she got up, and she searched, and I searched. And I mean, we looked everywhere, walking around the house. And then I actually went, let me get my old pair of glasses. So I got my old glasses. When I put them on, I realized only one, I only had one lens, right? So I'm walking around like this then, uh, looking for my glasses. So again, being uh, who Michelle is, uh, so wise and understanding, uh, she is the one that located my glasses. They were actually tangled in our covers, uh, our blanket. So apparently I fell asleep with my glasses on, even though I thought I had taken them off. So all I can say is I once was blind, but now I see. <laughs> so, uh, but it was a long night because then I couldn't get back to sleep because I was thinking how dumb that was. Uh, fortunately, Michelle was able to get to sleep not long after. So again, if I'm not all sharp, uh, please pardon that reality today. But it is an important moment for us today, this Palm Sunday. Uh, this day does stand out in the year for us as followers of Christ as we again uh, gather to commemorate and celebrate uh, Jesus in his moment of going into Jerusalem, uh, which he'd been telling his disciples was going to take place and had warned them as well, where he had let them know that it's not going to be pretty uh, when I get there, as three times he told them about his fate. And so today on Palm Sunday commences Holy Week, where we celebrate what Jesus did on the cross. And part of why we were going to walk outside is because this day is again a day where there was a public profession or public demonstration of faith in Christ, where this crowd had gathered, uh, a crowd that was gathered that day that was filled with expectation, exuberation, and exaltation uh, for this one who they believed would be king. In fact, if you remember the words they said, we said ourselves in the opening reading when they had the palms, you remember what they shouted? They shouted what word? Hosanna, right? Which is also in the song the kids danced to. They shouted out Hosanna. And what the word Hosanna means is, in essence, liberate us now, right? Save us now. Liberate us in this moment right now. And so they were shouting out for Jesus to do what they believed he had been sent to do, to again bring forth liberation for all God's children to experience. Not about you, but a lot of times in these days we live in, I find myself saying the same thing. Liberate us, right? Liberate us from these times that we are living in now. Liberate us from the divisiveness that is all around. Liberate us from gun violence that is still taking far too many lives uh, throughout our nation. Liberate us from this time right now. Liberate as you can do, God, for us now. And they also connected, I just want us to point out today, when they said Hosanna, they included with it to the son of David, to the son of David, Hosanna, liberate us to the son of David. They acknowledge Jesus as being the descendant of David and the one who fulfilled the throne of David. But just keep in mind again that David was the greatest military king that Israel ever had. David was the one that reigned over their enemies and David kept them safe and brought forth prosperity. And so in one way or another, the people were hoping that this King Jesus would be king just like David. They were hoping that Jesus would be king, and he too would wear a crown of gold and sit on the throne of David. What they didn't realize is this king would wear a crown of thorns and be hung from a cross. Because keep in mind, Jesus was a different kind of king. And so that's what was happening on this day. And one of the main reasons, again, that Jesus also, I have to point out today, that just to be aware, is it was the, it was the crowd 
that crowned him king. Remember that it was the crowd who gathered as he walked in. And it was the crowd who was saying, Hosanna to the son of David. That was on Sunday. But guess what the crowd was saying by Friday? They changed from saying, Hosanna to the son of David, to saying, crucify him. That's why you always got to be careful. Just because you have a crowd following you doesn't mean that what you're saying is right. Or just because you're running with the crowd. Sometimes you got to look around and check the crowd you're with. And not always does the crowd follow Christ, but the crowd will try to do its own understanding. So the crowd is there on this first day, this Palm Sunday, and Jesus is coming in to Jerusalem. And who could possibly have guessed that Jesus was riding to his certain death, a political execution on Rome's lynching tree? Who could possibly know what was going to be the end of this journey for him? Jesus' entry, humble and riding on a borrowed hoopty <laughs> of a horse, a donkey. Or was it? See, we've been studying Matthew's gospel together. That's what we've been going through since uh, beginning back in December. And in fact, if you look on the back of your notes to journey, I encourage you this week especially to spend time in Matthew's telling of what happens from Palm Sunday to Easter. And we've been unpacking Matthew, and Matthew was writing with a purpose. Matthew wrote his gospel to a particular audience and context. And for those who haven't been with us, I just want to go back for a moment and just state, Matthew was himself a Jewish outcast. Matthew had been a tax collector, someone who had been pushed to the outside, the margins of society because of the way he lived. But Jesus saw him working as a tax collector and called him to follow him. And Matthew then is writing his gospel to fellow Jews who have lost faith in God because when he's writing this, the temple had been destroyed and their faith had been crushed. What Matthew's trying to tell them is, hold on, y'all. You don't have to lose hope because you missed something that God did. God has already answered our prayers. God has already responded to our cries. God has already done something so great and you missed it because you didn't have your glasses. <laughs> the eyes of faith. And so he writes to them a gospel that really tries to tie Jesus back to Old Testament prophecy. Matthew painstakingly goes and tries to show all these different prophecies that Jesus fulfilled so that the Jewish community would receive Jesus as the Messiah, the Savior. And so you can see here in Matthew's gospel, I want to show you something that is very interesting for us to note, is that Matthew is quoting now from Zechariah chapter 9, this part. Tell the daughter of Zion, look, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a what? Donkey. And it says what? And on a colt. Right? And on a colt, the fowl of a donkey. Now, it's just interesting, again, as we study scripture, that's why I think we can get tripped up sometimes. Because when we miss the message, trying to get stuck in the differences, we can see what God is trying to say. Because I want to offer you today that maybe Matthew had a little uh, too much enthusiasm to prove how much Jesus matched up in everything. Because what Matthew actually says, if you look closely, Matthew then says the disciples brought to Jesus what? In verse 7, they brought the donkey and the colt, which means they didn't just bring one donkey. They brought two beasts for him to ride. But truthfully, Matthew has in some sense misinterpreted, misunderstood what Zechariah was doing. Because Zechariah wasn't trying to say that there were two beasts to ride on. 
What Zechariah did in the Hebrew poetry way is what's called parallelism, uh, where things are talked about in two different ways, but just one thing's being talked about. I'll give you an example. Psalm 24 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Now, the psalmist isn't trying to say that there's two worlds. The, world, the earth is the Lord's and the world and all who live in it. But he's speaking about one world. And that's often how Hebrew poetry is, Hebrew writings. So Zechariah wasn't trying to say that there were two, but there was one. But Matthew almost writes in a way, and I just have to share this with you because some have tried to figure out how in the world did this happen? What did Jesus do? Some have offered that perhaps Jesus did this. (laughs) Right? (laughs) But again, if we get in the weeds and lose ourselves for differences and discrepancies, we miss the whole message. What Matthew is trying to relay to us that all the Gospels speak about is how, again, Jesus entered into Jerusalem and he was well received. The people were anticipating what he could do. They were ready for God to do something. But so often in our lives, when we're ready for God to do something, we're ready for God to do it in our way in our time, by our schedule, and not by God's. In fact, what's interesting about this picture, I just want to say today for a moment for you to see the paint right here, is when Jesus rode in, it was the festival of the Passover, the highest feast for our Jewish brothers and sisters. It was a Passover. So Jerusalem would impact the people. But whenever there was a large crowd gathering in Jerusalem, the Romans who occupied Palestine, the Romans who controlled them, also send a large delegation of military to make sure what? Everybody chill out, right? We don't want anything getting started here at this moment when everyone's together. And so we know from history that just as Jesus would be riding in on a donkey, Pilate, the governor of Palestine, the Roman-appointed governor, would also have been riding into Jerusalem. Pilate would have been there during the Passover to make sure everything ran well. But Pilate would have come in in a whole different manner. Pilate wouldn't have rode in on a humble donkey with palm branches around him, his followers singing praise. Pilate would have rode in in a big steed surrounded by military might of Rome with swords and spears all around. Pilate would have come in the way that the world defines power. But Jesus rides in the way God defines power. Jesus comes in again with love and peace and and grace, but not a way the people wanted themselves. And so I want us to see how the power of God is being poured out in the first place Jesus goes, that Matthew tells us. It's not so in the other Gospels. They actually mention Jesus came into Jerusalem and then went to Bethany right away. But in Matthew's gospel, what we're told is that right away, Jesus goes and he enters into the temple. He, who is calling me? Who would call me? I almost want to answer this just to find out who. I don't know. Let's just let it go to voicemail. So that's my fault for not to. But who they obviously don't know me. It's 11.15 on a Sunday. It's 11.15 on a Sunday morning. And you all know pastors only work one day a week. <laughs> right? This is it. I just got to do an hour and a half and I'm good to go. So we'll, we'll let that go. to vo- Thank God for voicemail, right? <laughs> Always, right? But the first place Jesus goes to that I want you to see Matthew says, is the first place he goes is the temple. He enters into the temple immediately upon his arrival into Jerusalem. And the temple, again, is the center. You can see he goes in, enters the temple. Uh, The temple is the center of of Jewish life and identity. Uh, This is the second temple that's been rebuilt and the temple that survived now for hundreds of years. The temple was the center of the identity of the people. It was where their calendars revolved around the temple, their 
lives revolved around the life of the temple, the rituals and the relationship with God all was placed around the temple. The temple in Jerusalem was also their financial institution. It was the place of power. Those who ran the temple ran the people. Because in truth, what they had back then, of course, is our understanding of democracy, is they lived under a temple theocracy, where again, the chief priests could speak, and that was then the law by which the people were to follow. Now, Rome, of course, had the political power ultimately over the temple at this time, but for Jesus' people, the temple was the place where everything took place, and the place where things were defined, and defined about who was in and who was out, who was all right and who was wrong, who was of God and who was not, all happened in the temple. And the temple was a place that you would go to get yourself right with God, is the best way I could put it. The temple is a place you could go and get yourself right with God. In order to get yourself right with God, you'd have to make a what? Sacrifice. You'd have to make a sacrifice of some type of sort, either be animal or a harvest or some type of grain, a first fruits type of sacrifice. And what took place then over the years is as the temple rituals developed and the temple's own systems developed, is it came to a point where you would not bring your own animal or bring your own first fruits, but you go to the temple and you'd have to buy it. You'd have to go in and the temple, the Religion, the organized religion, the chief priest would sell you the acceptable sacrifice. But the catch is your money was no good here. The temple would not accept any type of coinage that had the imprint of the Roman emperor on it because it was sacrilege. It profaned God with the image of somebody else. And so you'd come in with your currency it's like a casino. I know we've never been there, right? I know you all, I know we've never been to the casino before. Lord have mercy, right? But it's like going to a casino, and if you sit down to play blackjack, so I've heard, and you sit down to play blackjack, right? You can put your cash out, but you don't actually pay with your cash. You have to what? As you've heard, so you've heard, right? And so you get your chips. Well, the temple would be the same way, that you'd have to buy a shekel, it was called. So you'd go in a temple with your currency, with the money you had earned, the money that was spent in society, and you would take your money in, and you'd have to do a transaction. You'd have to convert it over into a shekel. The problem is, of course, that the temple got to set the rate of how much a shekel would be worth. And so you'd buy your shekel, and then with your shekel, first of all, you had to pay your annual temple tax. So you had to pay the tax that was due. So that's the first thing you had to do is clear the books to make sure you paid your tax. Could you imagine if we had, I'm not even going to say it, right? <laughs> so you pay your temple tax, and then with what you had left over, you could buy your sacrifice, your dove or lamb or grain offering. And then once you bought that, you would take it, and the priest would then sacrifice. And based upon your sacrifice, if your sacrifice was acceptable to God, then you would know that you were now right with God. That was the temple system that was in place. And so Jesus, all along, had really been saying that there was something different God was trying to do that God was trying to explain that, no, you all have kind of gotten it twisted at this point. And God's saying there's something else you need to know and understand. See, what Jesus was trying to say to people and that we often still don't hear is Jesus was trying to say that, guess what? God is not for sale. You can't buy what someone else is not willing to sell. I was thinking, and my wife helped me clarify something that I remember from some Time ago, I don't know if anybody remembers this movie right here. Anybody remember this? What is that? Someone had Pee Wee Herman's bike, right? Now, for my millennial friends out there, uh, please go watch Pee Wee's Big Adventure. You know, oh, amen. We have a millennial who knows Pee Wee, so amen. <laughs> there is hope. 
for the future, right? I just want to clarify, sometimes my images don't translate to a younger generation because I forget that I'm getting old, right? Uh, but you remember Pee Wee's Big Adventure? If you haven't seen the movie, go see the movie. Don't watch a movie with Pee Wee, but see the movie, right? Y'all can get that later on your own, right? <laughs> And so in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, Pee Wee had this bike, and it was a souped up bike. It was a bike that had all these accessories. Remember what it had? It had rocket launchers, it had uh, blasters from the back to make you accelerate and go. Pee Wee's bike was, it was uh, tricked out. It was hooked up, right? It was the bomb bike. And see, Pee Wee had a neighbor who wanted to buy the bike. It was a, a rich neighbor uh, who was always asking, Pee Wee, can I buy your bike? And Pee Wee was always saying, what? No. It's not for sale. It belonged, it was loved too much by, of course, Pee Wee lost the bike, it got stolen, that's the whole point of the movie, but guess what? The bike meant too much to Pee Wee, it wasn't for sale. Well, God's grace and love means too much to God to put up for sale. God's grace isn't something you can buy, it's some, not something you can earn, but it's something that God gives to us freely because that's the nature of God. So Jesus goes into the temple, and what he does then is he goes and he, as it says, he turns over, overturned the tables. Well, I like to put a highlight there. He turned the tables. He turned the tables on. And when you think of turntables, again, if you're in my generation or even older, you may remember actual turntables, right? Anybody remember this? I remember I had a record play at our house I borrowed from my brother-in-law because I got the kids a record for Halloween and my kids were just like, what is that? And, and you know, when you put the record on and you had to lift this lever and the needle goes like this. And they're like, what's it do? You know, <laughs> it's not doing anything because they're used to what? Boom, boom, right? And of course, remember, sitting at your record and you're waiting for to try to catch. And, and the worst, of course, when that needle whoop, goes across, right? That's the worst sound. Or, of course, if your record got a what? Scratch, right? It wouldn't work. And so I remember I actually had one similar to this with an eight track player. Remember those? And cassette players. And I'm like, again, we've come a long way, right? from those days. And so you might think about a turntable that was used, and they're still used today by some DJs and the like. And so if you have to think about turntable, I just want to invite you today to also think about turning the table. How, in this case, Jesus goes in and he turns the table. And what it means to turn a table, of course, means that when you reverse one position relative to somebody else, Especially, it could be said, by turning a position of disadvantage into one of advantage. It has a turn table. When somebody turns the tables, what was is no more because now something new has occurred. And Jesus goes in the temple and he turns the table because, again, you cannot buy God. God is not someone that you go to find, but God has gone to find you. God is not living just in a place like a house, like a building, but God wants to live in you. It's not that we again go to church, but church goes with us because we are the church gathered in a building. And Jesus is trying to show that the tables have turned. God's love is not for sale. That God's house should be a house for everybody. And he turned the tables. But just I want to close with this understanding for us today. Is again to understand that just because you turn the table. Let me find where this slide is please. If you look where he says my house should be called a house of prayer. But you are making it a den of robbers. And I didn't put the slide in here. I apologize. Because after that takes place, after he has cleaned out the money changers, Matthew tells us that the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. And after he healed them, watch this, the chief priests get angry. 
They get mad that Jesus has healed the lame and blind. Which part of why they were mad is that for so long, if you were blind or lame, you weren't welcomed into the temple. If you were blind or lame, you often were also poor and couldn't afford to buy an animal to be sacrificed. And so no matter how hard you tried, you couldn't make yourself right with God because you didn't have the capital to make it happen. Angry that Jesus has healed those who were lame and blind, which again is just a reminder that when God turns the table in your life, not everybody is going to be happy. Not everybody is going to celebrate when God begins to do something new in your life. When people get comfortable with things being a certain way, not everybody's happy. Not everybody's happy when those who had to sit on the back of the bus come to own the bus. Not everybody's happy. Not everybody's happy when those who've been excluded and condemned by church simply because of who they love. Not everybody's happy when they're welcomed in and embraced fully for who they are. Not everybody's happy. Not everybody's happy when they see you come out of a storm with a smile, when you turn a burden into a blessing. Not everybody's happy. But I've learned in life to be happy, to give God thanks for what God does for you. Because if God does it for you, God has done it for me. And if God is at your house, that means God is in the neighborhood, and it's just a moment of time until it comes down to me. Because we are all God's children, and what God does for one, God can do for all. And so again, Jesus is saying to them, look, I have come to turn the tables, not just the money changers in the temple, but throughout this week of Holy Week, I invite you to see how Jesus turns the table. He turns the table of agony into triumph. He turns the table of suffering into redemption. He turns the table of death into life because God is in the business of turning the table. All we got to do is wait and see what God can do. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise.